Hi everyone. Let's start lesson number seven of Ethics, Governance, and Sustainability. So as usual, let us go through the scope of this particular lesson pertaining to corporate governance and shareholder rights. Starting from rights of shareholders, protection of rights of minority shareholders, shareholder activism, investor relations, OECD principles of CG, role of institutional investors in corporate governance, which is the crux of this particular topic. And under that, we have UK Stewardship Code, Principles for Responsible Investment, PRIs, the Code for Responsible Investing in South Africa, CRISA, and CALPERS, which is California Public Employees Retirement Systems. Let us look into each of these concepts in detail. Rights of the shareholders. So as per the Companies Act and also as per the LODR, there are various rights which have been conferred upon the shareholders which are self-explanatory so firstly right to receive dividend right to vote right to receive annual reports right to receive financial statements right to attend general body meetings right to inspect the statutory registers and returns of the company right to appoint the directors of a company right to transfer their own shares and finally equitable treatment so what is this concept of equitable treatment so to be you know, to be frank, the entire chapter or if you talk about right of a shareholder, the equitable treatment is something which is a unique right which every shareholder has, his shareholder can exercise. So what is this right of equitable treatment? It basically means every shareholder belonging to the same class of an equity share shall have similar rights. There cannot be two different rights for two different shareholders who belong to the same class of shareholders or same series of a class of shareholders. So that is what is a equitable treatment of shareholders. So we will tend, we, we tend to look into this equitable treatment in many other principles as well in our subsequent slides. Protection of rights of minority shareholders. So minority shareholders, as the name suggests, it basically means in the entire holding of a company where the majority is being controlled by promoters or the relatives or close aides of the promoters. And then there is a sect of people who are just representing a stake not exceeding say 10 to 10 to 15 percentage of a particular company. So they come under the ambit of minority shareholders for the reason that they with their holding per se cannot decide anything in a company and hence they come in the minority shareholders so in order to protect such minority shareholders there are three important sections which we need to refer to firstly section 27 so what is section 27 section 27 deals with a situation where you have already raised money from public by way of issuing prospectors and now you would like to vary the terms of the contract or the objects in your prospectus as per the section 27, as per the provisions of section 27, you can do it only by way of a special resolution. However, there, they know, I don't know if any resolution you have both the dissenting shareholders as well as the assenting shareholders, that is shareholders who have given a positive or an affirmation to your resolution, right? However, the other sect of the shareholders, that is the dissenting shareholders, they may still say, no, we do not want any change in the objects of a prospectus. Then what should you do? So for such dissenting shareholders, you should give a right to exit the company by at, a such, at such a price, which you call it as an exit price, which shall be in accordance with the procedure prescribed by the Securities and Exchange Board of India. So section 27 predominantly would apply only in cases where you have raised money from public by way of a public issue and listed your shares on stock exchanges and later you would like to change the terms of the objects or of the contract as agreed in the prospectus and then it amounts to certain people who are dissenting to such kind of a change in the vari variation or change in the objects of your company or variation in terms of the prospectus in either of the cases if there is any such shareholder who is dissenting to such decision, he shall be given an opportunity or you can say a, a, a price at which they, you will offer him to offer his shares back to the company and he'll be given an exit opportunity to go away from the company. So that is the concept of protection of a minority shareholder where there is a change in the objects which has already been produced in a prospectus. Then section 102 subsection 4, basically you know section 102 deals with explanation statement and subsection 4 to the 102 clearly states that whenever there is any kind of a non-disclosure or insufficient disclosure in an explanation statement, 
percent to which the promoter, director, manager or a KMP made any benefit out of such non-disclosure, right? So let us say they haven't disclosed that they are interested in a particular transaction, but later it turned, turned out that they are the actual beneficiaries of that particular transaction and hence they have actually benefited out of that particular transaction. In such a case, such monies whichever have been received or such benefit whichever has been received by such promoter, director, manager or KMP is deemed to have been put in trust for the company and later such director, promoter or a KMP or a manager is expected to compensate the company to the extent of the benefit received by him. Right. So whatever be the benefit received by such promoter, director or manager or KMP shall be compensated to the company. And finally, section 245, which is the primary section in terms of class action suits of minority shareholders. What does section 245 says? Say it says that you know wherever any security holder who is representing a particular class of uh, shareholders, I mean, who along with other security holders as well can file this particular suit anyways, because that is what's a class action suit. Class action suit basically means where you're not filing it on your own or, or for an individual cause, you're filing it along with other shareholders for a common cause. That is what's a class action suit. So where such security holders are of the opinion that the conduct of the affairs of the company is prejudicial to the interests of the company or its members or depositors or any other security holders per se, then such class of people, such class of shareholders can file a petition before or can file an application before the National Company Law Tribunal, the respect to National Company Law Tribunal. And then such application or petition can pray for certain relief like restraining the company to do something which is ultra virus, the AOA or MOA or to restrain or breach, restrain the company from breaching the provisions of the articles and such other reliefs which the minority shareholders put together and also under section 245, the prayer is being acceptable, right? So whatever be the prayer which the minority shareholders are coming up with, they can do it under section 245 in the way of a class action suit. So again, class action suit is a suit where you are not filing it on your own and not just for your individual benefits, but such suit has is filed by the minority shareholders along with other shareholders, right? So it is a class action. It is not an individual suit. It is a class action suit. A sect of people, a sect of shareholders have a, for a common cause are filing that particular suit. So that is the concept of class action suit. So these three sections, section 27, 102, subsection 4 and section 245 are the three crude critical sections in terms of protection of rights of minority shareholders. In terms of investor protection in India, there are two basic things which we need to know. One, the concept of SEBI and second, the IEPF. So SEBI, is a body which has been established under the SEBI Act 1992 with the object of protecting the interest of investors in India, right? So that is the role of SEBI and role of SEBI is something which every, every, in every student is aware of by the time you have come down to professional, right? So in your executive also, you have seen what kind of role SEBI plays in terms of protecting the investors through scores. It has a, it has provided a separate portal per se by the name scores wherein any investor can submit his grievance which will be forwarded to the prospective company right and also SEBI does investigations inspections etc to ensure no person is no investor loses his trust over the securities and the capital market in India and then the IEPF so IEPF as the investors education protection fund it is mainly targeting at conducting awareness programs or conducting awareness among the shareholders in terms of their investments. So that way it is ensuring that the investors are given adequate protection for their investments they're making in India. So these two play a crucial role in terms of investor protection in India. Now let us discuss the concept of shareholder activism. This is one important concept which is frequently tested even in exams. So what is meant by activism? So we uh, tend to listen to these words in the news saying activists. So what is meant by activists? So he who rebels or you know, revol revol revolves against a particular element which disturbs his interest is referred to as an activist. 
So shareholder activism means whenever any shareholder believes that his interests are being put at risk or his interests are not being addressed to by the company or where he thinks that a decision which is to be taken by a company would cause some kind of threat to the very existence of a company, then they can actually start such activism against the company through various things. So let us look into point by point as to what shareholder activism is and what are the modes through which I can undergo shareholder activism. So firstly, it is an active involvement of the shareholders in their own organization. And it can be exercised as said through proxy battles, publicity campaigns, resolution through resolutions, you can demand for more through litigations, you can file cases against a particular company and also through negotiations with the management. So these are certain modes which you will do through for the purpose of shareholder activism. And the primary object of that shareholder activism is to establish a dialogue with the management on such issues which concern the shares, right? And finally, let us look into one case study, which is Coal India. So what happened in this case? So one major, one investor, activist investor, so he had filed multiple cases against the company. So it was actually a company. So that particular institutional investor, it has filed multiple cases against the company as well as the government because it's being a government company with a prayer to prevent the company from signing fuel supply agreements with private firms guaranteeing lower prices than the market prices. So basically when a government company is guaranteeing low, lower prices than the market prices, it is beneficial for the private companies. However, it depletes the value of the government company, thereby depleting the value of shares of the shareholders. Hence, it has that, that particular shareholder had filed several applications before multiple forums thereby finally it had achieved after like long drawn battle they were able to achieve fairer terms like a better terms than what were actually agreed to by the coal india limited so here if you can see the problem there was no problem per se the coal india is signing certain agreement on certain terms which an investor is not comfortable with and hence through the shareholder activism that particular investor ensured that coal india does not go ahead or did not go ahead with such kind of a contract. So this is a classic case study under shareholder activism. So remember shareholder activism is one concept which is frequently tested in exams. Investor relations. So investor relations basically is a department in a company wherein it is only for the purpose of handling inquiries from the shareholders and the investors. And since the kind of questions such investors ask are multifaceted and a person who is working in an investor relation is expected to have knowledge on finance communication marketing and also the securities laws right? and the department per se totally should integrate these four aspects into its ambit finally the one of the recommendations of icsa is that every listed company should have an investor relations cell so as of now, there is no law which mandates every registered company to have an investor relation cell. However, it is always recommendatory to have one. And ICSA has recommended the SEBI to pass a regulation whereby the listed companies should be made mandatory to have an investor relation cell for their respective company. So this is the concept of investor relations. Now let us look into two basic principles on the OECD in terms of rights of shareholders. Even though there are six basic six principles, these two principles are relevant in terms of or in the context of shareholders rights. That is number one, the rights of shareholders and key ownership functions. So on the first slide, when where we have seen the rights of shareholders ranging from right to receive dividend, right to, right to vote, right to attend board meetings, right to discuss during the board meetings. So all these rights are covered under this particular right of uh, this principle talking about the right of key share of shareholders and key ownership functions and then the equitable equitability treatment of shareholders or equitable treatment of shareholders so what is this equitable treatment of shareholders we have already had a brief discussion on it so by equitable treatment again we mean every shareholder because belonging to the same series of a class or same class of shareholders should always be treated on par with each other there cannot be any difference in terms of how you treat them right number of shares may decide the amount of dividend but per share the dividend amount would never change so that is the concept behind equitable treatment of shareholders
Now let us look into the main concept of role of institutional investors in promoting good corporate governance. So institutional investors play a crucial role in terms of protecting the interest of the members who have invested in such institutional investor. So basically institutional investor and a shareholder, there is a direct, there is a bit of difference. A person who is actually investing fund in a company is a shareholder agreed. However, if such person is funded by a group of people, then such person is referred to as an institutional investor which basically means such person is not investing out of excess funds he is investing as a core activity of that particular company and for that core activity he has been he is being funded by a group of people right so institutional investors play a crucial role in promoting good corporate governance for the reason that they are actually investing some public fund into some other company and such public is actually trusting this company to act in the best interest of the public and hence this company should ensure this company by, by by this company I mean the institutional investor. So this institutional investor should ensure that the company in which that institutional investor is investing should comply with good corporate governance principles and hence indirectly the institutional investors play the role of a catalyst in promoting good corporate governance. So now let us look into the crux of the concept of institutional investors. So basically they are financial institutions which accept funds from third parties and then the purpose of accepting the funds is to invest it in their own name but again only on behalf of such third party the, by that we mean the return is something which is shared with the third party so it includes pension funds mutual funds insurance companies etc and the world bank recommendations there are three major recommendations by the world bank and the following you know following this slide we also deal with certain principles and even there these recommendations stand good so they are firstly, there shall be strict policies in terms of how you deal with your investments with respect to voting and also corporate governance. So the overall corporate governance and voting policies you have in terms of your investments. Number two, disclosure by the institutional investors as to how it would handle matters dealing with conflicts of interest so whenever there are any material conflicts of interest how does an institutional investor deal with it so by conflict of interest we mean let us assume you know an institutional investor one of I mean, the head of the institutional investor himself or the director of such company is also a relative of the head of the institutional investor which means there is always a chance of a conflict of interest and hence maybe the this particular investor the insurance investor may not raise voice against the other company. So how does the insurance investor handle such conflict of interest is very important in terms of such institutional investor. And finally equitable or equality of treatment. So this is something which we have already covered. Now let us look into the several global trends in terms of regulating or providing guidelines to the institutional investors. Let us look into it right. So the UK Stewardship Court, so as the name suggests, steward means you know leading from the front. So UK Stewardship Court, so how does an institutional investor lead from the front? Through what means does he do it? So firstly, the we will look into the seven principles which have been stipulated under the UK Stewardship Court. The first principle talks about the policy as to how the institutional investor will discharge his stewardship responsibilities so they shall disclose on their website the policy as to how they are going to decide or how they would actually display or how they would actually discharge their stewardship activities is number one principle number two is as to the policy on managing conflicts of interest we have seen under the world bank recommendations this concept Principle number three, how the institutional investor will manage the man investing company. So investing company is nothing but the company in which you have invested. So since institutional investors have many investments, so how do they monitor such investing companies is very important. And the guidelines as to when and how they will escalate the stewardship activities, right? That means suppose the company's script is falling down, like every day it is touching the circuit limit then you you have to escalate your stewardship activities and hence have a dialogue and, and then have a dialogue with the management and get to know the ground reality of what's going on. 
collective action by collective action we mean the institutional investor will not just act on his own suppose there is a cause wherein the shareholders rights have been infringed by the company then the institutional investor should not hesitate to join hands with the other shareholders and then the institutional investor is expected to have a clear policy in terms of voting and disclosure of the voting activity and finally they shall report periodically that is you know this reporting is nothing but disclosure so you have to report periodically and on their stewardship and voting activities as to how you know what are the situations where it had leaded in which which, which led the institutional investors to lead from the front and to gain some benefit to the shareholders and what are the events where it had exercised voting rights in terms of the investment so this is the concept or the principles identified under the UK stewardship code each principle is an important principle on its own and as a student do not just go into deep deeper understanding of each and every principle try to have a fair understanding of the principle by looking at the name of the principle itself right the principles for responsible investment is an initiative from the united nations so pri they are comprising of six basic principles as i look into what they are firstly the esg issues that is the environment social and governance issues shall be incorporated even when you are making an analysis of your investment and then before decision making so before decision making and while during during the course of analysis of a particular information or an investment you can take a choice as to you know incorporating your esg issues into it or not but the pri suggests or basically you can say it recommends for incorporating environmental social and governance issues into investment analysis so when a company is investing in any other company so when an institutional investor is investing in any other company that institutional investor should ensure that even the company in which the institutional investor is investing has proper esg issues being handled then number 2 incorporate the same issues also in the ownership policies and practices number 3 the institutional investor shall seek appropriate disclosures on esg issues by the investing companies right so wherever the esg issues have to be reported by the investing company the institutional investor should always be behind such companies to ask for such adequate information the institutional investor shall promote acceptance and implementation of these principles so the united nations clearly specifies that the institutional investor should promote these principles whatever he has been agreeing to under pri and also support it unconditionally collective action which we have already seen and then to report on activities and progress towards implementing the principles right so they shall always report whatever be the activities and programs which have been undertaken by the company or by the institutional investors to implement all these principles such report shall also come under the ambit of pri that is principles for responsible investment now let us look into crisa which is code for responsible investing in south africa similar to any other you know we have seen the previous two codes right so what are the previous two which we have seen so firstly we have gone through the uk stewardship code talking about how to lead from the front and secondly we have also gone through the principles for responsible investment now let us go through the code for responsible investing in south africa which in short is called as crisa so on the crisa the first part is again similar to that of your principles for responsible investment because even this is a code for responsible investing and hence whenever you find the word responsible it's imperative that esg always follows so firstly you have to incorporate the esg issues into investment analysis as well as investment activities which is the same point then acceptance of ownership responsibilities so we even that we have seen collective action handling conflict of interest even this is repeated and then transparency through disclosures so basically crisa all the five principles are just added on through the previous you can you can find it in the previous two slides as well and then finally let us look into calpers so what is calpers california public employees retirement system so this basically is a pool of fund which they collect from all the employees and then such fund is being invested in various entities and the returns from that entities will be distributed in the form of pension to various employees that is public employees basically so under this ambit 
they have identified various principles which would guide them in investing in a particular company. So they have given that particular company where we invest, they shall comply with certain things. Let us look into what they are. Firstly, director's accountability. So it, such company should ensure that its directors are accountable for the acts of the company. And then transparency. So the disclosures have to be made through a transparent manner. Then long-term vision. So such companies should have a long-term vision. Productive labor practices. The company should always have productive labor practices. No labor. It's not. There should not be a concept of prohibited labor or child labor in place. So it should be productive labor hours or labor practices which the company shall adopt. Companies should have proper corporate social responsibility initiatives in place. And finally, the company shall have code of best practice as a code of conduct and code of ethics which shall be adopted by the company. So these are basic, you know, I've just identified material things under CalPERS, but there are many other principles which CalPERS has adopted in before, you know, in terms of investing in such a company. So it is more or more like a parameters which they have identified for investment in several other companies, right? By this, we have finished chapter number seven. So remember chapter number seven basically deals with the role of institutional investor as a shareholder and what are the rights available. So under that, all these global trends are very important, right from UK Stewardship Code, PRIs, CRISA, CALPERS. These play a crucial role in terms of examination because one of this is mandatorily to be questioned, right? So prepare it in that passion and ensure you, you are confident while clearing this particular chapter. Right? Thank you. We'll finish off with this. Thanks.